everybody. Welcome to my Shalom Zone. My name is Sherry Dawn, and it's my great honor and privilege to get to share this grace encounter with you today. I would like to invite you to subscribe and feed your inner man something to make it grow and glow. And how can I say that? Well, the scripture tells us in the book of Psalms that the entrance of God's word gives light, and it does change your countenance. Hit like and share and give somebody else a chance to do the same thing. Decree with me, I am destined to reign with Christ. And I will not try to avoid that destiny. I am being transformed by the renewing of my mind. And I will embrace the truth that I am loved, I am blessed, and I am more than a conqueror through Christ. Woo! All right, good stuff. <laughs> now, I don't know if you know this, but Father God, our Creator, has a thing about names. He likes to give them, and He likes to change them. For example, we find in Genesis chapter 17, where God encountered Abram for like the fifth time. Abram was 99, and because of promise, he had been looking to have an heir for over 20 years, close to 25 years. This fifth encounter during this time, God told Abram that he was changing his name from Abram to Abraham, which means father of many nations. He also said Sarai, or Sarai, depending on how you want to pronounce it, would become Sarah, which means a princess, and would bear him a son. Her name would be changed, which would make, of course, her the mother of multitudes. Then he said that the son that they bore would be called Isaac, which means laughter. So right from the start, we see God has a thing about names. And God changed the parents' names, Abram and Sarai, or to Abraham and Sarah, simply by adding one Hebrew letter, the He, which is a letter that stands for grace. And within a year of having their names changed, Isaac was born. Isaac then had a son named Jacob, uh, whose name means supplanter. And God later renamed him Israel. Israel means he will rule as God. So God changed his name because through his lineage, the Messiah who was going to rule the earth was going to come. So we have another name change. Remember when the angel appeared to Zacharias in the temple and told him that he was going to have a son and to name his son John, okay, and then the angel of the Lord appeared to Mary and told her to name this child that was going to be born of her by Holy Spirit intervention, that his name was to be called Jesus. During Jesus' ministry, he changed Simon's name to Peter. After his resurrection, he changed Saul's name to Paul. <laughs> so... We see that father and son have this thing about changing names. And if you'll notice, in the lives of the people whose names they changed, their characters were also changed as well. Our names are part of our essence of who we are. And sometimes, when God wants to set a plan in motion, He starts out by giving somebody a name or changing their name. Now, in Revelation chapter 2 and verse 16, the scripture says, He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith to the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna, and will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth it. So we see even after the resurrection, God is going to be giving out names. And that should inspire us with comfort and courage and hope because when God gives you a name, He empowers you to live up 
to what that name means. He doesn't just give you a name because it sounds good or because it happens to be the popular one going around at the moment. He gives you a name because it means something and it's going to help transform you to become what he's called you to be. In Ephesians chapter 4, I want to start reading at verse 14. The scripture says, For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. So God the Father, uh, the, he's the of whom, <laughs> the whole family in heaven and earth has received a name. So we have to understand, first of all, there is a family in heaven, there is a family in earth. Family is from the Greek word patria, and it means a paternal descent, a group of families, or it can mean a whole race or nation. So paternal descent is your lineage that's bound and based on who your father is. Okay? This is one of the reasons 2 Corinthians 5 and 17 says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Some translations say creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Well, all things would include a new name to go with the new identity which was received in the new covenant of grace and peace. All things new, including that name. So of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height, and to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge, that you might be filled with all the fullness of God, now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us, unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Now there, there are so many things contained in those few verses, but I want you to notice the progression and I want you to notice the connection he wants us to be able to comprehend with all saints. He wants us to know the love of Christ that passes knowledge so that we can be filled with the fullness of God. And he is commending us unto him that's able to do exceeding abundantly above all we can ask or think according to the power that is working in us. Well, what power is that? It's the dunamis power of his Holy Spirit, the same power that he releases when he gives us a name. So put that in some way in, the, in your little pocket and think about it later on. I want to share with you out of Isaiah chapter 62 and show you a prophecy regarding names. Isaiah 62 verses 1 through 4 because this is going to have an impact on you and where you go from here. This is going to have an impact on the last day's transfer as the kingdoms of this world become the kingdoms of our Lord. This is important. Isaiah 62, verse 1, For Zion's sake will I not hold my peace, and for Jerusalem's sake I will not rest, until the righteousness thereof go forth as brightness, and the salvation thereof as a lamp that burneth. So, we were made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus when we received His gift of forgiveness and salvation by faith in the work that he did for us at the cross. So righteousness is our identity in the new covenant, and it's tied up with the fact that it was given to us as a gift. And he wants this righteousness to go forth as brightness. Brightness is from the Hebrew word nogah, and it means brilliancy, light, brightness. And this reminds me of the verse in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 14, where Jesus was speaking, and he said, You are the light of the world. A city that is set on the hill cannot be hid. And he is determined that the righteousness that releases the brightness is going to go forth so that we're not going to be hid. So if that's part of your nature to want to hide somewhere, start praying and asking for grace to get over it because we're about to be made open, very open, okay? 
That revelation of righteousness and salvation shining and going forth means that they're active. They're not just present, but they're active. What does righteousness design to do? Isaiah 32 and 17 tells us that righteousness works, peace, or shalom, the safety and the peace, the tranquility, the prosperity, the restoration, the wholeness, etc., so forth and so on. That's what he's wanting to turn loose. That's what he's wanting to go forth as brightness, okay, and the salvation thereof as a lamp that burneth. Now, we know that this is a last day's event. Isaiah 62 is a continuation of Isaiah 61, which announced the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ and wherein he was making the kingdom of God visible. And then you read on a little further and you find out that he handed it on down to the priests and that it was going to affect nations. So it covers thousands of years just in these couple of chapters. But this is important that we get our time frame right. Verse 2, the Gentiles shall see thy righteousness. And all the kings the earth, all the kings thy glory, and thou shalt be called by a new name, which the mouth of the Lord shall name. So whatever is destined to happen, this new name that God chose to give us has a part to play in the brightness going forth and the salvation, a lamp that burns. Lamp is from the Hebrew word lapid, and it means a lamp or a flame, or it can mean lightning or a torch. So God's history regarding names is that when he changes the name, it changes the person. Verse 3, I'm still reading in Isaiah 62, verse 3, Thou shalt also be a crown of glory in the hand of the Lord, and a royal diadem in the hand of thy God. So if you're still thinking of yourself as a lowly beggar, or so unworthy, or a worm, or any other definition of anything that's less than a crown of glory, Start asking for grace to get over that and to break that image out of your thinking because that's not who you are. If you're born again, you are a crown of glory in the hand of the Lord. And this time frame lets us know that what he's talking about doing, this brightness going forth, it's in that time that his glory is manifested on his people in this earth. Mm. Something is going to so transform the family of God that... That righteousness becomes visible. The light begins to go forth and become visible. Verse 2 said the Gentiles would see the righteousness and the kings, the glory. And the fact that they see it is implied in the way that that sentence is put together and written. And it's all connected to the fact that God was going to name us a new name, give us a name. Now, how much fasting and praying and spiritual warfare have I talked about so far that we have to do in order to make this happen? None. <laughs> All we have to do is get a revelation. Okay? Verse 4, he said, Thou shalt no more be termed forsaken, neither shall thy land any more be termed desolate, but thou shalt be called Hephzibah, and thy land Beulah, for the Lord delighteth in thee, and thy land shall be married. Okay? Now, how can he delight in me? I can just hear some of you thinking, how can he delight in me? I still mess up. Well, it's because of the mystery that is Christ in us, the hope of glory. And the Lord blessed the tornado siren in their practice sessions. All right. Isaiah chapter 42. Isaiah 42. It's not enough that we have the trains. We've also got the tornado sirens. <laughs> oh, Lord have mercy. Isaiah 42, verse 1. How can he delight in me when I still mess up? Isaiah 42, verse 1 says, Behold my servant whom I uphold, mine elect in whom my soul delighteth. My soul delighteth in this person, okay? We're going to find out that it's Jesus. I have put my spirit upon him, and he shall bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. He shall not cry, nor lift up, nor cause his voice to be heard in the street. A bruised reed shall he not break, and the smoking flax shall he not quench. He shall bring forth judgment unto truth. He shall not fail, nor be discouraged, till he have set judgment in the earth, and the isles shall wait for his law. Now, if you go on over to Matthew chapter 12 and verses 17 through 21, that's quoted. This 
particular passage of scripture is quoted regarding Jesus and the fact that when everyone wanted to rush in on him and just kind of venerate him and hold him up, he would just ease away and hide himself because he wasn't after making a name for himself at that point. Okay, so this gives us a time frame. This also helps us to understand. But the fact that God testified of his son that he delighted in him, okay, delighted is from the Hebrew word hafetz, and it means to be pleased with, to take delight, to desire, to have pleasure with, to favor, to incline toward. This is how God looks at Jesus. Well, the scripture tells us that in Mark 1 and verse 11, at Jesus' baptism, my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. That's what God said about Jesus. Jesus believed that the Father was pleased with him. He went into the wilderness and he overcame all of the temptations of the devil and he was armed with that truth. I am God's beloved son in whom he is well pleased. In Matthew 17, in verse 5, when he was on the Mount of Transfiguration, and the scripture says a bright cloud overshadowed them, and Moses and Elijah appeared and talked to Jesus about his upcoming decease. And Peter, of course, was wanting to make tabernacles to, for all three of them, put them all on the same level. And God immediately spoke up and said, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. And I've shared with you before, he was stressing, hear him, not hear them. The law and the prophets represented by Moses and Elijah, they've had their time. They've done their job. They fulfilled their mission. Now it's time to hear him. Grace and truth. The word made flesh full of grace and truth. Okay. So you are in Christ. He is in you. And that's the reason God can call you Hephzibah, even though your flesh may still have fits every once in a while. And it's in calling you Hephzibah, which means my soul, or in her, my soul delights. Okay, or I'm delighted with her. When God calls you that, that has the power to transform you. And he wants you to understand that. And so that light going forth and that shining and that brightness and the revelation of what he's wanting to do in these last days, it's connected to, tied up with us receiving the truth. God said he delights in me. Mm. There are changes that God wants to make in us and around us that cannot be made till we humble ourselves and accept the new name that goes with the new identity and the new covenant. Abraham and Sarai did not produce the miracle child until their names were changed to Abraham and Sarah, and grace was added to the equation. In Isaiah 51, verses 1 through 3, the scripture says, Hearken to me, ye that follow after righteousness, ye that seek the Lord. Look unto the rock whence you are hewn, and to the hole of the pit whence you are digged. Look unto Abraham your father. He's the father of faith. And unto Sarah that bear you, she's the mother of grace. For I called him alone and blessed him and increased him. For the Lord shall comfort Zion, and he will comfort all her waste places, and he will make her wilderness like Eden, and her desert like the garden of the Lord. Joy and gladness shall be found therein, thanksgiving and the voice of melody. So, when he tells us to look unto Abraham and Sarah, that's the covenant of grace because this new covenant uh, is referred to as that covenant in Sarah, in grace. And when you look at Galatians chapter 4, it compares the old covenant at Mount Sinai and calls that Hagar, which was the Egyptian bond maid. And it tells us that, that law covenant goes into bondage. But uh, Sarah, who is the mother of us all, that's the new Jerusalem, that's freedom. And it's all tied and connected to the grace and mercy of God. He says that he's going to make the wilderness like Eden. Well, if you back up to chapter 14 of Isaiah and verse 17, you find out that it's Lucifer that made the world a wilderness. He's the one that messed everything up. When he got Eve deceived and talked her and Adam into taking that fruit, they opened the door and they let the destruction in. And he's made a mess out of it ever since. But God has declared, I'm going to name you Hephzibah. My delight is in you. And I'm going to make your wilderness like Eden. Well, now guess what Eden means? It's from the Hebrew word Aden or Adan, and it means delight and pleasure. So God has not given up on his dream of having pleasure in his people. 
of delighting in his people, of having the very area where they live be a garden of delight and pleasure. And when he speaks a thing, it's going to be fulfilled. He told us to look at Abraham and Sarah. Look what happened when their names were changed and they humbled themselves to receive those names. Now, how do we know that that happened? Because history records them as Abraham and Sarah. So evidently they told somebody. They submitted to it, they agreed to it, and the miraculous began to happen in their lives. They started a physical dynasty here in the earth that was going to transfer over to a spiritual dynasty. A dynasty is simply a succession of rulers who belong to the same family. Well, they started the family of faith in the earth. The family of kings and priests who dare to believe that God delights in them and who believe that they're forgiven who believe that they are yoked to Christ in kindness, who believe that through receiving the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness, they will reign in life. This is the kingdom that becomes the great mountain that fills the whole earth that we read about in Daniel chapter 2. So I want to encourage you today. Think about what that means when God said, I will call you Hephzibah. That's your name. If you're a born-again child of God, that's your name. And he spoke that over you to let you understand he delights in you and his delight is you, in you is not based on your behavior. It's based on the fact that you're in Christ and Christ is in you. And he loves you and delights in you just because you're his. But the thing is, is when you open your heart and you make a decision, I'm going to believe this. I believe God delights in me. After all, he loves me so much he gave his son for me to be made sin with my sin so I could be made the righteousness of God in him. And he did that while I was his enemy in my mind. I choose to believe he delights in me. Watch what happens on the inside of you when you make that decision to believe that. You are going to be so wonderfully, pleasantly delighted and surprised. Let me bless you. Jesus Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father. And that same glory dwells in you, for it is written, Christ in you, the hope of glory. The blessing of the Lord be upon you to help you walk out your new life of victory. You are called to walk on top of everything that opposes the will of God in your life. You have angels assigned to you to minister for you because you are an heir of salvation. You are not alone. And you're not without hope because you have a covenant with Almighty God through Christ Jesus. Blessed are you of Almighty God, possessor of heaven and earth. Blessed is the work of your hands. Blessed is your land, for the Spirit of the Lord is upon it. The glory of the Lord is risen upon you. Nations see that you are the seed which the Lord has blessed, and they are drawn to God through you. For you are a city set on a hill, and you cannot be hid. Mm. Let us pray. Well, Father, you are so amazing. And I, for one, am just so very glad that you take pleasure in naming us and in renaming us and giving us glimpses of the transformations that are taking place simply because you changed our name. Thank you that you delight in us. Thank you that you are building the Hephzibah dynasty in this earth. Thank you for awakening our hearts to see ourselves as you see us, to perceive what you've placed on the inside of us by your Spirit. Help us to humble ourselves and get in agreement with that so that you can do what you desire to do in these last days. Father, we give you all the praise and the glory because you are so worthy. Thank you that you first loved us. Thank you that you're teaching us how to love in return. We give you praise in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. All right, dear friend. I hope you have an absolutely fabulous day. And I'll talk to you later.